Okay, good evening everybody. I think we've got about 52 participants this evening signed up so far. We were hoping that given that we've sold out, technically speaking, and should have up to 108 attendees, that we maybe would sell out. But anyway, shall we make a start? Um, good evening, my name's Andrew Reynolds, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the chairman of the City Architecture Forum. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all for the second of our spring uh, City Architecture Forum lecture series. Um, for those of you attending who are members of the forum, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, and we've got a lot of new non-members, uh, a very warm welcome to you as well. Please do uh, consider joining our Merry Little Forum. Uh, we try and have events throughout the year, and we are hoping that we can meet up again, as the uh, Majesty of the Queen said a few weeks ago, we all meet again. Um, if not before our annual dinner, then our annual dinner in November. Anyway, enough of me to this evening's event. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Eric Parry to you all. Eric, many thanks for joining us this evening and obviously welcome. Um, what can I tell you by way of an introduction to Eric? A friend, an architect, a visionary with an extensive and varied back catalogue um, of both commercial, cultural and academic spaces. Eric, I think, is really a, a city shaper with projects not just in London City and West End, but as far afield as Tokyo. And indeed, last October, he was very kind to give me the names of some whiskey bars in Nihonbashi when I was over there for the Rugby World Cup. So, glo a global traveller. Um, his other memorable non office designs, and that's kind of where we come to today, for me, include the Holborn Collection in Bath, a wonderful mix uh, of old and new. And then, of course, the stunning Leather Sellers Hall in St. Helen's Place in the city. So, uh, continuing the Livery Hall's theme, tonight, Eric is going to talk to us about his new project, his latest project for the Cloth Workers Company at 50 Fenchurch Street. Uh, he recently fe featured on YouTube, as I'm sure he'll tell us in a second. Um, and that project ironically sits directly opposite his last city project, which was uh, Ten Feng Court, uh, the Generali scheme on the north side of uh, Fenchurch Street, uh, which I'm sure most of you know from the stunning roof gardens. Um, I think it was interesting that the city had its first um, live, <coughs> excuse me, tra planning and transportation committee meeting on the 14th of um, May when Eric had the chance to present his scheme to 50 Fenchurch and those of you who didn't watch it as you would expect pretty much everybody on the committee supported I think there was one abstention wasn't there Eric at the, on the day one miserable councillor but otherwise carried very nicely anyway um, without further ado Eric is going to talk to us for about 20 minutes and then we'll have questions and answers thereafter so if you'd like to pose your questions then I'll kind of try and um, deal with those on the techie side. But Eric, over to you. Andrew, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I hope you can hear me. So uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be back because I was in the audience two weeks ago um, as a resident of Golden Lane to hear John talk about uh, the magnificent recladding of Great Arthur House. And um, yeah, so uh, here to speak about 50 Fenchurch. And I must say, I had very little to do with the presentation of it at that first virtual planning meeting. It was Gwyn Richards who principally uh, um, spoke to the scheme uh, brilliantly. And, um, and I just had to chip in with a couple of questions. But uh, let's go straight to the presentation. Um, so I'm uh, in Rowena's hands, um, and uh, we uh, there we go. So I hope everyone can see the screen. Um, yeah, I think this is now maturing in a really interesting way. Of course, the Eastern Cluster soon, hopefully, to be called something else, but. Uh, it's it strikes me as a as an extraordinary accumulation. Um, within this picturesque idea of an uplands and lowlands, um, uh, so it's very much in the in the English tradition of 
kind of landscape thinking as opposed to the tradition of continental axiality as in La Défense or um, the uh, Allées of Frankfurt. But it's been brewing now for, for more than uh, 25 years and it's, it's getting a certain kind of maturity um, and a huge amount of discipline, I think, with every bit of the jigsaw that comes to uh, the realm of a, a real possibility. So um, it's one of, one of those, an intense uh, question about public realm gain, about the effects of tall buildings uh, in terms of comfort. And uh, so the, the very beginning, which it's, you know, like many of these projects, probably at least um, two years in the, in the maturing, in the marinating, uh, you can see that actually the building with the green slip and top um, is the one we're talking about, inflected elevations to the south, sitting, um, as it were, in dialogue to some extent with the uh, Vinoli design tower, uh, behind which it sort of loiters from Western views. But from here, you can see, um, actually, if it were a complete form, it would be not a dissimilar scale to that building. Uh, and I had always thought in the first instance that it should express open greenness rather than an enclosed garden, um, and we'll come back to that. But over the, uh, over the course of the, um, the, the dialogue with uh, the planning department and others, um, the fragmentation formed an interesting and important part to west and east. So the west side of the building at 36 floors is three floors higher than the east. And it's uh, the inflections on the geometries will mean a different light condition. So it is, a, as it were, a split, a cleft rock. Um, and um, so let's move on to the current condition, if we may, to the second slide. Thank you. Um, just to remind you where we are. Yes, you, Andrew kindly mentioned um, Fen Court, um, 120 and the roof garden, uh, which is on the 15th level, and another whole story, which I won't touch on, apart from, you can see the splitting of that in plan, which gives these 12 meter or thereabouts openings running north-south through to the set of buildings uh, that preceded us, um, and obviously, to uh, Lloyd's and the other buildings. So there's this sort of sense of continuing the, content, the, the tradition of passage, which is so important. Just to note, you've got Fenchurch Street Station, you know, which issues out into a very interesting space, trapezoidal space, but then peters out into these lanes and one gets very lost. And you can see that coming out into uh, the space of, uh, of Mark Lane and London Street, the bottom image on the left, you'll see sticking out above the 50s church hall uh, to St. Olaf's, um, the 12th century tower uh, of All Hallows Staining, um, a remnant, I mean, the rest of the church collapsed effectively, uh, but a very, very important remnant, grade one listed, uh, uh, building um, sitting in isolation and, and unapproachable apart from a gated passage up to it. Behind that is the rebuilding of the um, of, of the cloth workers livery company um, with the offices on that stone flank, essentially a brick element, a donut around an open well in which the dining uh, space of the livery company sits. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a sort of space that's really unrequited in terms of what's happening in the city. As you can see from the photograph on the top left, looking west, 
down uh, Fenchurch Street with the buildings that will eventually become part of this site. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, further, further views, obviously, again, when you come around the corner uh, Plantation Place, you sort of get a sense of, uh, of the scale of the, uh, of the walk talkie in the background. Uh, the east looking down to Allgate and the lower, lower sort of scale, and then below, uh, once you're within the curtilage, which is not public, you find the, the tower. And around the tower in the 19th century, a crypt was rebuilt, so it had come from the London Wall, um, was rebuilt at south of the, of the tower. And you can only get into it by going into the tower and creeping down a, a ladder um, in uh, this, uh, this very early um, rib vaulting uh, that is rather fine, but was actually re-erected in a rather piecemeal way. You'll see um, just off Fenchurch Street, um, and Mark Lane, there's a there's a um, an alley that runs through with what many may know is a rather good uh, greasy spoon, um, but it's a very tight alley. And it's like a broken broken uh, broken arm, as it were, as it comes round and goes east west. So it's a sort of cul-de-sac, and then it then it finds its way onto Fenton Street, and that's really the only public passage on the site as it stands. However, um, the, the site has been pieced together with leases and so on, so, uh, um, so that it is all up for redevelopment, um, very interestingly. Um, so there it is. So that's where we start. Now the question was, do you clear, a, obviously the, the, this amazing uh, tower, uh, uh, you know, remains. Uh, do you form a large plaza opening up from south to north to Fenchurch Street and then a tower block on top of that? Or do you think in a more three-dimensional way about the way that the building would rise? And, of course, the requirement essentially wasn't absolute, but um, it just made so much sense that of course, if the site were redeveloped, the cloth workers would have to find a new home on the site, and that would have to be disentangled from, from the commercial um, potential of the office space. So that's kind of the, the problem. Um, and moving on, uh, in, in, this is jumping a bit, but there was a sort of sense of how um, this might break down and uh, early days there always was the idea of taking the cloth workers in and around below and around the grade one listed tower um, and uh, the question of this openness or otherwise was was a key so what then evolved was the idea that uh, the head of the delivery company would find a building on Fenchurch Street as entrance with offices above, which the little sketch on the left shows. And by canting and opening up the space, you could frame the church tower. So the soffit here, with that sort of indication of reflection, is at about 17 meters above, uh, above street level. So a big opening, generous opening, with the office reception space mooted to the right and an arm of the building rising to the 10th floor, as you can see on the right-hand slide, uh, would slide over and find its, uh, its support off the cloth workers building as a sort of anchor, so that there was this, uh, this sense of gravitas to the building. Um, and uh, above that, then, you get a, what you'll see in a minute, a sort of, uh, there's a horizon, first of all, to the 17 meters, and then at the 10th floor, you get another horizon and a double height uh, opening that would give rise to a public access to that level, not to the top of the building. So that was an important part of our 
deliberations, but at the same time, taking liberating the public space. So as you come out of uh, the station, you come round and you find an echo of the nave of the church, you find planting, you find a place to sit, you find within the building the conviviality of, of, uh, of perhaps cafes and um, you find also the entrance that will take you down, as I'll come to describe, to the crypt and up to the public level at the 10th floor. Um, and uh, so you create a surrounding to the church tower and you create the, uh, the building um, to, and at this stage it was flat and cubic, but changed with its geometry um, in terms of the building for the clock workers upon whose land this is all being built. Next, please. So this is the ground plan as it became, um, it, as it evolved uh, for the planning application uh, with a, an enormous amount of publicly accessible space at the ground. Um, the opening, the clock workers um, entrance with a sort of double cubic uh, space of six by 12 by six on the front on, on Fenchurch Street, uh, lifts and staircase, and then the grand staircase so that you go through and you get always your orientation as you go down, but you get the orientation across a light well to the church tower, and then you can see the demarcation of the nave, which is of course not there at the moment. Uh, the mauve um, to the, within the building is the entrance for the public to go up, or indeed down at that point. You've got the yellow, which is the reception, which takes many forms, but we have banks of double, uh, double, double, double height lifters. So you've got uh, a mezzanine level uh, in order to get into those. Uh, you've got your service bay at the corner of Mincing Lane and Dunster Court. Um, and you've got your cycle entrance from Dunster Court. Um, and the retail flanking what is actually a sunny space and a, what proved to be a very good space from the point of view of wind. One, you know, um, it's uh, for, for maybe massing reasons in part was very little problem with wind. So that space, the public space is going to be, I think, very pleasant. Just worth noting, big, big benefits. So at the moment, the street on Fenchurch Street is, is terribly thin and you get pressed to the buildings, you never get a sort of uh, a sense of ease. Um, now that goes up six meters and these large scale columns take their place at a sort of ordering of uh, 27, 30 meters. It's a, it's a giant order that goes up to the 17 meters and uh, collects the structure from the building above uh, to which we'll now go. So next slide, please. Uh, so these are then the, the CGI's of that moment that on the north side of Fenchurch Street actually aligning with the passage through to Fen Court on the other side. So now you get that continuity to the existing passage, which is quite grand at 10 meters uh, with its digital uh, camera obscura um, ceiling. But here, yes, you get the entrance, the grand entrance, you get the offices and you actually get a couple of flats on the very on the on the neck below the the uh, commercial building and uh, what it came to be of the setting of the tower which you can now get into because actually um so you know a lot of negotiation positive negotiation with archaeology with um conservation and of course um, historic england uh, uh, in terms of actually setting the tower better by taking away and, uh, and drawing it down to its earlier level um, and uh, giving, therefore, the, the openings the, um, the dignity that they somewhat lost in, in the accretion of time. So uh, there you are. You can see the double, the, the, the giant order column um, that is just in place as part of the Fenchurch Street rhythm. Um, and next, please. Uh, we get to that section for the public. 
<clears throat> so the crypt, which had already been moved, is rebuilt uh, within the curtilage of the new commercial building with um, a, a, an interpretation center, possible rebuilding of bits that aren't there uh, to give us an idea of scale, uh, getting a bit of light from above and, um, and, and a stair and the lift down. Very important, it's an amazing site in terms of its history, obviously with clockwork as in before. So this will be a place where you'll be able to discover uh, a lot about the site or choose to go straight up to the public, uh, publicly accessible gardens and retail on the 10th floor. Next, please. So for the cloth workers, they have, as I've already described, the entrance business building, which is the admin center and the day-to-day -day <coughs> running of the cloth workers uh, uh, premises. And below that, you get a sweep of, uh, of stair that descends and it always has the, uh, the tower um, uh, of All Hallows staining as a sort of reference point with a large uh, roof light that takes you down to the court level um, and then below to a winter garden. Um, the tower is of course suspended um, and it acts as an entry point to the uh, reception space and then the dining space. So, a normal sequence of livery hall spaces that very much echo the sort of scale of the, uh, the, the current uh, livery hall. Um, so uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's a kind of sense of scaling that will be very familiar when it's rebuilt. Um, uh, although the descent and the sequencing is 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 different um, in in terms of its right rights passage. So next, please. <clears throat> so this is that section, um, the entrance with its uh, its tall uh, level, the two offices, the accommodation in the in the building above street level. Uh, the staircase riding down through to the winter garden with views up back um, and the importance of the material of the, the head building and the soffit clear as you process into the livery hall. Um, and one level below that, which is much to do with plant and to do with, uh, to do with storage and so on. Next, please. The commercial deal is then a, uh, a combination of the floors <clears throat> from uh, one to nine being with the arm that gives the pacing to the uh, length of the building, which is in the region of 75 meters, uh, along Fen Church, perhaps a tad more, in fact, at um, 78, 36 meters at the west end, and expanding, but it gives you a floor plate of uh, approximately 30,000 square foot over that set of, uh, of the building. And then to the levels rising to the 33rd floor, um, floor plates of approximately 25,000 square foot. Um, and you'll just see the inflections that are working around these two, uh, these two, um, areas that are cut out between the east and the west flanks of the building as it rises up, which will become evident in a minute. But uh, those are two of the, uh, of the typical floor, commercial floor plates. Next, please. Yeah, on level 10, you come up from the point that I just, uh, just indicated for the public, you come up in the lifts, and you're coming into a foyer and then into a double height south facing winter garden. So that's what you're getting a snippet of on the left hand side. Um, and you've got retail in the, uh, in the green. Um, and then beyond that, you've got, um, you've got the open garden that goes all the way around at this level, double height like the winter garden. 
Um, and uh, the landscaping, both of the ground and this level, uh, has been done by Christopher Bradley Hole and his team. And they come up with this very interesting idea of vertical, um, vertical stems of planting around timber armatures in order to maximize the public realm up at this level. So uh, that's, that's what we're, we're, we're seeing as we move on, please. Uh, yeah, so here you've got that uh, 10th floor level. And um, above that, you get the commercial office plate with the spandrels made in a formed glass so that it has a kind of crystalline quality uh, that will be reflective um, and work with the, the, uh, the glazing between uh, with the inflections to catch the light differently. The, the glazing to the levels below are a, um, a, a, a cavity uh, triple glazed system to kind of work ambiguously with the scaling of those floors uh, up to the ninth floor and along the line of Fenchurch Street particularly. Next, please. So we get the section of the commercial building with the uh, lip cores falling back as you get up to those top levels. Um, the 10th floor incision, 10th and 11th floor incision, as you can see for the public, and then a roof terrace for office tenants up at uh, level 32, um, and the building then rising up uh, to uh, level 35. Uh, with plants above. But what we've done in the gussets between these is to uh, instigate a planting regime which will um, have like the shuckles of a of a of a a, uh, of <coughs> a, a weaving loom. Um, they, they span uh, to the south some nine meters to the north six and a half meters and each level has a hydroponically controlled tray in which the, uh, the evergreen plants can grow up. And so you get a very dense weave of planting that encapsulates also the plant rooms, um, giving this very green appearance to both uh, east, west, and then the gussets running down to level, uh, level 11. And um, just whilst we're on this, you can just see the sort of ordering of the mid-levels of level one to nine, then the, uh, the large double height below to the ground, taking in reception, loading bay, retail, um, and mezzanine access to uh, the double-decker lifts. Um, and you can see to the right, the the, the, the way in which the cloth workers can be independent can be built into that section of the building. Thank, thank you. Next, please. And then we just get the elevations. Um, on, on the left is the image along uh, Fenchurch. And again, if it had been a, a tall, uh, a tall, one singular building uh, rising from the ground, it would have been pretty dreary on the street, but this incision on the 10th and 11th means you don't get an overbearing scale to the shoulder of the street. And uh, so you can see that on the elevation to, uh, to, to Fenchurch Street um, and the 17 meter, the base with it, I, I, I anticipate a very nice haptic quality of the ceramic. Um, um, and then above the quantum of greening, um, and uh, then, then, yeah, to the uh, you get the the, the 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 image of it sitting within the cluster, and then the southern elevation um, with the tower set in its protective embrace. Next, please. So finally, it's a bigger picture. And in my mind, the negotiations have been so interesting with an open and receptive uh, planning department, um, but having established the 15th floor garden uh, at uh, Fen Court with the 10th floor um, 
meeting room terraces uh, that encapsulate the difference between the body of the building uh, to the north and then the 10th and 11th publicly accessible gardens and retail on uh, the proposal for 50 uh, and then the cascade down to the new public realm and the opening down to the winter garden um, uh, from uh, just north of the tower gives a sort of sense of, um, uh, of amazing uh, opportunity of a cascade of public space so that the quantum of increase of public space on the site of the proposal as is, is, is 36 times what is available at the moment, um, creating a very convivial space to meet in the city um, and part of a cascade of public realm benefit um, that is so important in the increasing density of the city. So, Andrew, I will stop there, um, and I think, I hope that's about an appropriate time to, uh, to answer questions with you. Eric, that's perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Um, we've, got, we've got a few questions coming in, so please do feel free to pose them and I, you know, send them through and I will ask. Um, if I may, I will start. Eric, um, obviously the client is always most important in these things. How, when you compare uh, what you've presented to the cloth workers livery, uh, does this differ from what you did when you did the leather sellers? Were they, were the cloth workers mindful of modernity? Were they very fixed in their old ways or just, just kind of share those if you can? Um, in both cases, of course, we um, we we were de dealing with um, um, a a kind of working group. So I wouldn't say we dealt with the court. In either case, I, I certainly with the other sellers had to had to uh, make presentations to the broader. Uh, Body. But the point is that I think that well, the leather sellers was a result of a pre-existing uh, and separated, um, uh, as you know, under a Bishopsgate scheme. So this was uh, this was a refashioning of uh, a, a historic space and Helen's place, and was relatively um, uh, distinct, I would say, from the commercial aspect of um, of a hundred. Uh, here, of course, unlocking the scheme meant that the two were much closer in proximity. So mm -hmm. I don't think the parallels are particularly there, um, but obviously the mercantile and um, you know extraordinary makeup of the city between its livery companies and and uh, uh, the Corporation of London, you know, are two of the uh, two of the keys to the the jigsaw of the city. So this is. In, in respect of the potential of a site, uh, just helping in our way to find a plausible reality for the commercial development of the site, which settled over, over as I say, two years of discourse um, to where it is now, um, and, uh, and, took, and took time on both parts to, 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 uh, to sieve out the uh, the implausible from the plausible to get to a point where um, the development could take place in a in a, in a in a straightforward relatively straightforward manner. Great. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Right. Some questions in now. So I'm I'm going to kind of um, re paraphrase them if I may. So first question is from our good friend Bradley Baker. Hi, Eric. He says many thanks for the presentation. This is the question I think we all have on our lips tonight. In the light of COVID nineteen. What changes, if any, do you envisage may be necessary to the specification of your building? Thanks, Bradley. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, you know, we're, I, I do think that um, there is scope in this building to achieve, you know, a, uh, a density of one to eight. All the lifting is based on that, um, perhaps a little less up at the very top levels. Um, but clearly the lifting, the vertical transportation is based on that, on those terms. Um, you know, I think that would be something to be uh, to be looked at. Um, it's it's generous if it is less than that. So, 
uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it will have to be figured in that way. But I, you know, actually when I look at the public realm um, and you're not, and, and the street, you know, at the moment you're pressed hard to the street. So I think the urban answer is a good one because you get that uplift of 36 times in terms of the potential for social distancing. Uh, actually our cluster, I think by chance, the, you know, the clusters um, and the way the seating is organized in the public realm looks great from that perspective. So um, it is actually going to be a common question, is it not? Um, that the city is, as a whole is going to have to look at and we need to look to agents um, to think <laughs> about how the commercial, commercial deals will be made and how space ensues. But in an ever decreasing uh, world of possibilities in terms of, of development of the envelope of the, uh, the Eastern cluster, let's remain with that for the moment. Um, you know, this has to optimize the opportunity. So I think it is what it is and we must, we must move forward and wait for, wait for answers that will s solve this uh, plague-like conundrum. A uh, great answer, I think. Yeah, the, the jury's out, isn't it? Okay, next question is from Roshan, who asks, how, uh, hi, could you explain a little bit more on how the green landscaping of the building came about? Yeah, great. Um, so we are building in Singapore. We have a little office in Singapore. We're very mindful of, uh, of what is, uh, how landscape and buildings have worked very well there, for instance, and in other other places. Uh, but at the moment, we're, we're, we, we've got a scheme on site that is uh, covered in landscape, um, and it's uh, it's really interesting. Um, ever since Peter Fogo, you know, it's and I can remember his words. You know, we are blessed in this country. You've got some soil, you've got some water. You can grow things. You know, you put seeds in the ground. You can get uh, you can get green roofs. I mean, that's, that's like three decades and more ago, you know, that's going back to Broadgate and Wiggins Teep and so on. So I've always been mindful of the potential. Here, the opportunity arose to, uh, and you know, once we got the disposition of benefit sorted out, um, it was obviously the green agenda was being pushed very hard by Gwyn Richards and his team. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that's really being championed that I think it's fair to say eyes on other successful um, greening um, of cities. For me personally, places like Milan, where you look up from the gravitas of the street and you see a world that you wish you could access because it's so beautiful. Um, that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, what I go back to in terms of the horizontal greening, uh, I must say that I looked down from a scheme we were building uh, of about 18 stories onto the most absurd uh, mid-level um, below of uh, abuse in terms of plant, literally. So that's where the idea of the garden was born on, uh, on, on, at Fen Court. And now this is the opportunity to act you know, in urban design terms, rather than just architectural terms, as a kind of collective of spaces that become greater, I believe, than the sum of the parts. But more than that, there is a danger in the homogeneity of material of the Eastern cluster that I've been aware of a lot. Mm. And so this, this evergreen and very, uh, you know, serviceable, because there is a space behind that greening for the gardeners to get, to, uh, to service from both sides, um, that this very strong greening that has a certain, a certain kind of uh, formal quality, uh, like topiary, rather than just the uh, a sort of live and let live attitude to landscape out there in nature, um, is something very strong. So I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a very strong presence of green in that, uh, in that uh, perhaps they in danger of becoming too homogenous uh, kind of scaling of glass. So I see that as really, 
particularly strong vertically, set against the accumulation of horizontal greening that is to do with amenity and the restorative power of nature in the uh, you know in the passage from you know from home to work and back you know I think it's incredibly important uh, which is the sort of uh, wonderful thing in, in Fen Court as you go through and you see a sense of the presence of the garden above just to whew, take a take a breath and a, and, and a break you know and be able to eat your sandwich somewhere and, and you'll be able to do that at all these levels here so greening takes it part in different ways from the horizontal to the vertical from the ground to the 10th to the 15th floor great okay next question um slightly controversial i don't think we got any planners online maybe or heritage people but as a designer of tall buildings in the city what is your opinion of protected views that's from james lansbury yeah, I think, wow, the, you know, the viewing corridors, we've been with this for uh, nearly 100 years now, right? So Yeah, you know, absolutely. Well, um, since Mr. Wren, really. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, uh, but actually, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. And um, where, at, you know, so that uh, I think height is appropriate where it is, it is carefully placed. Um, I think obviously protecting those views and actually I must say the you know the rigor with which every application that I've been involved with through Townscape so important you know really close scrutiny of, of how elements that have been ascribed uh, quality uh, you know importance are protected I'm completely with it's got to be part and parcel of the planning of the city uh, of, uh, in, in for, the, for future generations. So it, it is uh, a, a great thing to have constraints. I think constraints, you know, can, uh, can create opportunity and the opportunity is not just in the single building, but it's in the proximity and the dialogue between the parts of the, of the, uh, of the whole. Great, okay. This is one where you may have to plead the fifth. Um, has a date been set when demolition is due to commence stroke construction to start? I shouldn't, I mean, this is beyond my remit, but all I can tell you is it's remarkably, been remarkably well um, positioned. So um, uh, yes, it could, it could uh, it, it, in, in the, uh, literally in the first, uh, you know, from the, from, from the, uh, from 2022, it could go ahead. Great, okay. Um, now, this is lovely. I'm sure Tina from Generali would love this. So an, an anonymous attendee has said, was a connection or bridge from 50 to 120 Fenchurch ever considered? A bridge? Ah, yeah. oh, well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Three presuming that Tina's not on this call tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, you know, there's 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 a, a metropolis question, you know, yes. <laughs> uh, drones and uh, and scuttling across across uh, great streets and things. Now, I don't think I think I think they all have their their place as independent gardens, which will be wonderful. Um, so, no, um, and, uh, and and of course, you know, um, I I want the creation uh, Fen Court to to really thrive, which it will. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's more, it's a more Hong Kong, Shanghai kind of thing to have, you know, connections above the street, isn't it? So. Yeah, but it is, you know, it's all an ownership, a freehold ownership. It's all that we've been talking about is on uh, great cloth workers' land. Yeah. So they, right. they become, the, you know, the, 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 they, they become a great, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, a, a, an extraordinary exemplar for others. Mm. Great, okay. Mr. Richard Saxon, here you go. Lovely building, Eric, but it's very glassy. And how are you ex expecting to minimize carbon emissions from energy use? Hi, Richard. Um, yeah, terrific. You know, we've been working very, you know, this is, uh, this is an Arab triumph. So, um, you know, I think we've got, in terms of orientation, um, yeah, we've got a lot of south in the tower. Um, 
but we've been through a very careful exercise. It's a brilliant use, as I've said, you know, as a whole, um, it, it, uh, it has the benefit of many parts of culture, um, of commerce, um, you know, and of historic monuments. Um, the, the calculations and the circular economy that will be part of the discussions going forward are all incredibly relevant. Um, uh, but I think the, uh, you know, we, we have uh, been careful to work through the closed cavities and the, and the structuring of the, of the building to get a great answer. Where, where we're gonna end, you know, we're certainly at excellent, where we're going to end, I'd love to repeat what we've managed at King's Cross, which was the first Briam outstanding to, uh, at that point, 2014 regulations. I hope we're going to massively increase, as we have with every building we've done, the, uh, the performance of the building. And I'll come back to you with more detail. Thank you. Maybe, maybe another, another kind of expose next year. Right, JJ from Savills has said, um, what were the decisive factors in, in the final height at which you uh, landed, as it were? Was it heritage? Was it a mixture of lifting? Of course, the there is the, of course there is the, the question of optimising of, of lifting, but it starts with townscape. You know, it starts with townscape, it starts with intuition rather than science, I believe. And it's, it's an accumulation within the envelope and where the envelope starts and stops to fulfill the idea of the, the protection of the southward area, the eastward area, you know, and, uh, and of course, westward. Um, so it's really a judgment that is made by uh, the city planners and, of course, the, uh, the planning all those who advise on the right of passage. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, the, uh, there are many principles, but good, great floor space is so important for the city and variety, um, you know, of floor space, which this scheme, I believe, answers quite nicely. Um, so it, it, it is one then of how you get from a height and how you work with the long distance views right down to what will be the haptic pleasure of material at the street and the improvements one can make. So it is about doing better. Great, okay. Um, this is a planning barrister, Martha, who says, Eric, how did you, you and the client team overcome the objections from historic royal palaces, the World Heritage Tower backdrop? No, well, we, don't, we don't need an hour. We may need. An hour. No, no. Well, um, overcome is interesting because actually, I, I think I'm telling tales out, uh, out of school. So, but I'll be careful. But yeah. you know, we presented to um, those who were concerned, and they did under their breath say it's a very good scheme. So you know, there was an acknowledgement of that, and then there was a fear of precedent, no doubt. Um, but actually, so, you know, and I know um, of old, um, um, you know, Dan Cruikshank and, um, you know, uh, Barbara and others who have their concerns. I think it's a quality product. And I think I, all I can say is I think that was borne out by the vote. Um, and on the day, on, indeed. On, yeah. on the day, which, you know, um, that... And I, what I don't believe is that people do kind of come to a reaction without necessarily taking a balanced view. Um, so there might, it might just be an objection on, on principle without seeing the, the whole story, the benefits. For instance, uh, you know, it's quite clear historic England were, cap uh, were happy mm. and supportive. So, you know, of course there are going to be voices against, but I believe we've got a fantastic mix that is going to benefit the city. And I think that's what was uh, borne out, obviously, by the vote. I would agree 100%. Um, here's the, the, the flip side of that would be, without the backdrop of the Eastern Cluster and with the same brief, how would you approach the design? Would you go really tall? Would you go 
Guinea, Pencil Tower? No, I think that that marination, if I can call it that, of, of thinking, which I completely applaud. I mean, I think we are strange. Um, you know, the city is extraordinary in terms of its limitations and it's, there's plenty of wonderful conservation areas that need to be respected and so on and so forth. Um, but, I, but, but I actually think this idea of landscape is an incredibly clever one and part of a cultural uh, rootedness. Um, so uh, it would have been a completely different thing if it had been in a grid city or in, in, in Europe, you know. Um, so I think it's found its place within that uh, carefully formed view of the possible um, that the city has, uh, has established. So, you know, I think what, we, what is fascinating is if I th go back to Fen Court, that started, by the way, as a point block in a plaza. And I was told to go away because um, it needed to be a building that respected the street, which is where the urban block came from, which is where the garden came from. So it's not, my will it's actually a dialogue and finding kind of rules in the way of precedent with an open planning uh, 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 you know uh, group um, of very concerned uh, uh, and uh, i think um, well well uh, just very well educated can we say you know and thinking uh, um, Planning, planning system that is open uh, to dialogue rather than just the kind of uh, the shut door um, that one finds in, in many local authorities. So I, I think like English law, you know, this is something very particular and, and well balanced. Great. I, I think it's, we've seen a change, haven't we, as well, in the, in, within the corporation as well as the heritage people. Um, question from Christa Dyson who'd like to hear a little, know a little bit more about the public realm and the tower and how those pieces work together. Because I think they're the key, aren't they, to unlocking this site? Well, we obviously, I mean, you know, for, for a moment, I thought dreadfully of that American kind of precedent of putting a building on, on rails and moving it. But actually, all the meaning in the tower as an access mundi, you know, and a stabilizing element, that um, should be absolutely where it is was 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 key. Um, so that's the first thing. So it had to spin around that. Then there is the balance of all the things like retail, servicing, um, you know, all the lifting that is going to take a certain quantum of space. Um, and uh, you know, I I remember early conversations where. Uh, the idea, because the entrance to the underground and where you could form uh, basically what is, you know, about <clears throat> just a, a little more than 200 people to dine in, in the livery hall uh, space at about nine meters. Um, it's quite a large hall, um, not the biggest, but, uh, you, know, um, at, you know, how you dispose those pieces and create this processional way um, and from my previous experience of working with subterranean spaces, not least at St. Martin the Fields, what I've always felt absolutely is that you must maintain orientation as you go underground. You know, this is as ancient as, ancient as, uh, as, as the myths of, of classical myths, mythology, you know, that uh, the, the darkness and the trail of thread um, you know, you need to, and that can be a great thing. So as you come, uh, I haven't shown you the, the sort of the images from the, the, the passage down. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be rather wonderful as you go down and you see up at St. Martin Fields, it was, I always called it the third perspective because there had been Gibbs and then Nash and then the subterranean viewing of the spire, you know, is the third perspective. This is giving an entirely new perspective to what is, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a space that is shared in the delivery company underground, and working out what the quantum of light was for the winter garden at the bottom and how that would work is key to the opening, and as a balance 
with the passages and the sort of flows that we are going to get through the site moving northwards. Um, and uh, there are more complications than that, but perhaps that's a start to, uh, to, Chris, to an answer to Chris's question. Great, final question, because uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, James Taylor from Woods Baggett. How much vertical greening do you think the City of London should promote? Second question, can there ever be too much? Yeah, well, you know, we've got to, you know, we're not living in, in, uh, in, uh, in a kind of uh, primitive state. And when you're working, you've got to see out and, you know, I, uh, and enjoy the prospect. So, um, you know, I think a concentrated thinking about greening and layers of greening, um, not just in this sense, but building by building part of the cluster. It, it has to be a kind of compositional thing, which is uh, urban design in a, three, in a three dimensional sense, which can be quite fascinating. But I think <clears throat> it can obviously become an absurd one liner when a building is totally covered in green and you can't see out. Yes. <laughs> and I think on that happy note, <laughs> Eric, shall we finish there? I'm conscious of time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening and for sharing the scheme. I think it's fascinating. Um, as I know from many hours I've spent with the planners in the last couple of years on two other projects I'm working on in the cluster, they, they are getting better, as, as are the heritage folks. But I think you did brilliantly in that virtual meeting to just have one abstainer out of the whole of the committee. So congratulations on a brilliant scheme. Thank you again. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, please do think about, particularly for, for our non-members who've joined us this evening, looking at the rest of the series throughout the, the summer, which are all online. But thank you for joining us and good night. Thank you. <laughs>